All right. Today is Wednesday, the 8th of February, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Now, folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's start by this. The zombies at the Fed are now realizing that, holy shit, the Maverick of Wall Street was actually right. We made a mistake by going down to 25 basis points instead of 50, by listening to the crybabies who are sponsored by the oligarchy, by the way. And now we're facing the risk of perhaps inflation rebounding higher. And we might have to go back to the public and say, whoops, we did it again. We're a bunch of morons. And we have to go from 25 to 50 basis points again. I'm not saying this. The market is now saying this. Traders are now saying this. The odds for a 50 basis points in the March meeting is exploding higher. Therefore, all of a sudden, the zombies from the Fed all over TV today talking about how tough they are. And I know they're going to get the job done. Even if it takes uh, two years, three years. You heard the demon from Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari, the dove of all doves, all of a sudden talking hawkish and tough. And he remains delusional, by the way. We talked about that in last night's video. Not to mention Chairman Powell. That's a tragedy, of course. But today we got uh, commentary from Governor Waller, who says that inflation doesn't look poised to rapidly fall to the central bank's 2% target. Oh, you think? Leaving policymakers with more work to do. How about you do the work right now? How about you finish the job right now? Grow a pair and do 100 basis points right now, get inflation down, and then you take all of these hikes off the table again. You can do that easily. But you guys are spineless. The weakest human beings ever. You know why? Because you guys at the Fed are too tools for Wall Street, for the oligarchy, and you take orders from them rather than doing what you know you should do. And oh, by the way, what happened to the uh, to the bull market? I thought we're in the bull market. We're going to go higher, all-time highs. It's done. It's over. Today, Jim Cramer says, another ridiculous decline in the bull market. Never stops. Um, You mean uh, maybe reality is starting to sink in? Those who've been chasing the rally and calling for the end of the bear market and the beginning of a new bull market, maybe, maybe they're realizing that they shot their loads prematurely. But are we at the moment of, whoops, we made a mistake? Not quite. Although you got traders such as Art Cashin, who's been trading stocks since the dinosaurs roamed the planet, he says that the upside last month surprised a lot of veteran traders. But he is skeptical of the rally. But what does he know, right? He's just a jealous boomer. He's jealous of the gains. But perhaps, folks, the market is stalling right now because it is realizing that the false assumption behind the rally, well, it is false. What assumption are we talking about? The market has been rallying year to date with the promise that the Fed will flood the market with coke again. That's all there is. But we now know that the likelihood of that happening is pretty much 0% with inflation revving higher again, with the Fed making a mistake. The likelihood is they're going to add interest rate hikes, not cut them. Forget about coke flooding the market again. But we have hope here, folks. If the Federal Reserve not going to pump cocaine into the market, we're going to go to New Zealand. Why New Zealand, Maverick? What's going on here? Well, the headline reads about half a billion dollars worth of cocaine, enough to service the New Zealand market for 30 years, was found floating in the Pacific Ocean. And of course, the New Zealand authorities are holding all of this uh, treasure for inspection purposes. They have to look at it. They have to study it and look at it closely, maybe take a sniff or two. But hey, there's a lot of it. So maybe they're going to be generous enough to supply the US market with some of this um, newly founded treasure. All joking aside, folks. Okay, so the rally's stalling. Uh, the Fed is not going to give us drugs anymore. What do we do here? What do we do? You know what? We don't need the Fed anymore. We have a new source of optimism, which will take us all the way back to all time highs. And this new source of optimism is layoffs. That tsunami of layoffs. Cut those jobs, baby. The machine wants more and more and more layoffs. And that's going to shoot stocks higher and higher and higher. What are you talking about, Maverick? Uh, layoffs? Recession? The economy collapsing? Is that good for the stock market? Yes, it is. At least for now. So let's talk about it. And here it is. In Focus Tonight. That tsunami of layoffs keeps getting better and better. But I'm going to take you back to the State of the Union, and let's hear what uh, President Joey B. said last night. Take a look. Two years ago, the economy was reeling. I stand here tonight after we've created, with the help of many people in this room, 12 million new jobs. More jobs created in two years than any president's created in four years because of you all, because of the American people. Two years ago... And two years ago, COVID had shut down, our businesses were closed, our schools were robbed of so much. And today, COVID no longer controls our lives. 
And two years ago, democracy faced its greatest threats in the Civil War, and today, though bruised, our democracy remains unbowed and unbroken. As we gather here tonight, we're writing the next chapter in the great American story, a story of progress and resilience. When world leaders ask me to define America, and they do, believe it or not, I say I can define it in one word, and I mean this, possibilities. We don't think anything is beyond our capacity. Everything is a possibility. Now, you know, he's lying through his teeth, of course. We created 12 million jobs, man, in, in Africa and America. Give me a break. Come on, man. I marched for civil rights in Africa with President Nadella. I'm deadly earnest, man. But I say when CNN fact checks your ass, you got caught lying, Jack. Of course, the president says that he created, keyword created, 12 million jobs. New jobs, he says, in the economy. Of course, CNN are going to be diplomatic. They're not going to say, yeah, liar, liar, pants on fire. But listen to this. Biden's number is accurate. The U.S. economy added 12.1 million jobs between Biden's first month in office, that is February 21, and January 23. That number is indeed higher than the number of jobs added in any previous four-year presidential term. However, it is important to note that Biden took office in an unusual pandemic context that makes meaningful comparison to other periods very difficult. Biden became president less than a year after the economy shed nearly 22 million jobs over two months, March and April 2020. This is during the Great Panic because of the thing. The jobs recovery then began immediately after that, under then-President Donald Trump. But there was still an unprecedented hole to fill when President Biden took office. Now, I went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics kitchen uh, numbers, and I grabbed an Excel sheet, and here's what I see. The media, of course, is not honest with you. The media will never do this job. They're just going to repeat the misinformation over and over and over again. But in 2020, net-net, the economy lost about 9 million jobs. Then in 21, added about 7 million jobs. Keyword added, not created, because we panicked, we got rid of a lot of jobs in leisure and hospitality, and then we hired them back. So there is no creation. There is adding back. Then in 22, the economy added about 4.8 million jobs. And so far this year, if we believe the number that we got uh, last month, the economy created about half a million jobs. You take it all together, all of the jobs added to the economy since February 21, but you factor in that the economy started in the hole, down about 9 million jobs, then all all in all, under Biden, the economy added about 3 million jobs, not 12 million, 3 million jobs. Which is not bad, by the way. When we look at other presidents, you have to compare them with uh, one-term presidents. Now, in the Trump administration, net-net, the economy created about 4.7 million jobs. But mind you, he also went down about 7 to 8 million jobs due to the thing. So he did pretty good, considering the fact that he is a one-term president. But perhaps a more applicable comparison is with uh, Bush, Father Bush, not dumb Bush, who created about 2.9 million jobs in four years. So Joe Biden is already ahead of uh, Bush, Daddy Bush. Bush, not dumb Bush. He's not going to replicate the number by Carter. Jimmy Carter added about 9.8 million jobs, but he can't catch up with uh, Ford's number, 3.6 million jobs. And then we have another one-term president in JFK. He wasn't actually a one-term president. He got whacked by the CIA. But anyways, under his presidency, the economy created about 2.4 million jobs. So Joe Biden is doing pretty good. So why the need to lie? Why the need for exaggerations? You're doing pretty good. Keep it up. You get to three and a half, four million jobs by the end of the term, assuming the economy, of course, uh, holds up, which is not going to happen because um, corporations figured out a way to fluff up their margins now. And who predicted all of this, by the way? Yep, the guy you're listening to right now. In November of last year, I said the fact that Meta stock is surging on layoffs optimism. Remember, the company laid off over 10,000 employees. And I said it should be concerning, extremely concerning, to everyone. Now corporate leaders are realizing there is an easy way to please investors. Conduct mass layoffs. And I warned you folks that we're going to see that tsunami of layoffs coming. A lot of you said, hey, Maverick, you're a boomer, you're jealous, you don't know what you're talking about, you're doom and gloom, yada, yada. What you got to say now? Because we're just warming up here. This is becoming contagious because stocks are down, CEOs look bad, their margins are getting crushed, the consumer is getting weaker, so revenues are going down. The only way for them to improve margins is to cut expenses. The easiest way to cut expenses is to get rid of employees. And today, after the bell, the tsunami of layoffs continues. We heard from the company that uh, labels itself as 
as buy now, pay later or never, a firm, they cut about 19% of the workforce. Now, this is a company going bankrupt. So they have to cut jobs. But there are companies that are not going bankrupt. They can afford to keep their employees, but their investors are not happy. So to fluff up the stock, what do you do? You announce mass layoffs. One of those companies is Disney. The happiest place on earth, baby. Once you get your uh, pink slips, you're still going to have a smile on your face. Today, after the bell, we got the news that Disney is announcing uh, restructuring plans, quote unquote. And part of these uh, restructuring plans is cutting 7,000 thousand jobs and this is just the beginning take a look but it is just showing the steadfastness from Bob Iger under the duress of activist investors such as Nelson Peltz that they have to cut, cut costs. 5.5 billion, it's interesting that a lot of that is going to be coming from content, yeah. is where they seem to be outlining about 2.5 billion yeah. overall. But I do think it's interesting, they're trying to just, as we understood, streamline entertainment. We mm -hmm. expected that, be giving more perhaps focus to creativity, as he says. And then theme park unit, cruise lines, consumer products all being brought under yeah. one particular now, the geniuses who've been buying the stock market in the monkey rally that we've been seeing year to date, and imbecile Jerome Powell, of course, they believe in this soft landing, meaning inflation is going to go down, but we're not going to see a lot of harm in the economy. We're not going to see a lot of job losses in the economy. And I say, you wait. This is just the beginning. Look at the correlation between corporate profits and the unemployment rate. Now, corporate profits sky high in the last few years. And the reason is the Fed been flooding the economy with cocaine. Interest rates are zero. Companies can hire however number of employees they want to expand at any cost. But now the profits are down, but we've been covering earnings here, folks, in this channel. And we continue to see that corporate profits are plummeting at a rapid scale. So they have to get rid of employees. The more, the merrier. If you look at this correlation, as corporate profits go down, the unemployment rate will rocket higher, perhaps to 3, 4, if not 5% or more, as corporate profits plummet. So uh, soft landing, you say. I say buckle up your seatbelts and say, a prayer because you're gonna need it unless of course you're a Gen Zer. if you happen to be a Gen Zer, you're actually happy that you lost your job according to a survey from the Harris poll members of the Gen Z are most likely to react with feeling of happiness when they get fired mm, what's going on here maybe of course uh, the Gen Zers they don't like their jobs and they think if they get fired that's an excuse to go back and live with mommy and daddy or maybe they're gonna get a job in McDonald's and get free happy meals for example or maybe it's gonna give them the excuse to become a full-time TikToker or uh, start an OnlyFans. I don't know. But the message to corporate leaders here is your stock is down, your investors are not happy, you want to fluff up your stock. You gotta have to do some mass layoffs. Look at Disney stock, surging after hours. Last time I checked, it's up by 7-8% on the uh, layoffs optimism. So you might want to get rid of some folks. And guess what? You don't have to feel bad about it because the Gen Zers will be happy. Why don't you make some Gen Zers happy? I have never, ever been happier! And with that out of the way, let's move on to the coverage of the stock market and we begin with the closing of the indices today and uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average is down by 207.68 points or a decline of 0.61%. The Nasdaq leading the pack to the downside, losing 203.27 points or a decline of 1.68%. The S&P also down by 46.14 points or a decline of 1.11%. When we look at the sector's performances today, shame on all of them, all of them down. But the laggards were led by communication services, aka uh, Google, down big. And then utilities down as interest rates are moving higher. And guess what happens when interest rates move higher? We talked about the lag. Technology fighting the Fed, fighting the bond market, fighting reality, fighting everything. Well, today, technology succumbed to reality and rising yields, and it went down to. We'll see if that's going to stick or not. My hunch is it will. And the ad performers, led by energy, healthcare, and financials. So the ad performers, a combination between the inflationary theme and the recessionary slash defensive theme, also known as risk-off. When we look at the advanced to decline ratios, NYSE, 25% advancing versus 74% declining. The Nasdaq, 26% advancing versus 72% declining. And mind you, throughout the rally, for the most part, it has been led by bad breadth. Not bad breath. There's Colgate for that. But we're talking about breadth, meaning that the majority of the rally was due to a stampede in the big cap technology names. Not because the Nasdaq is healthy or the NYSE is healthy. Throughout the majority of the rally, the advance to decline ratio has actually been pretty bad. So keep that in mind. I 
back to commodities, what do we see here? The dollar pretty much flattish for the day, went down, then it went up, no major movement here whatsoever. So we have muted reactions here in the commodities cohort, but we continue to see oil at performing, crude oil, be it the WTI or Brent, both up over 1.5% apiece. And this is of course happening on the heels of massive gains from yesterday. Yet we have muted reactions in the gasoline RPOB and heating oil futures. On the other hand, natural gas futures down big every time natural gas attempts to rally. Um, something push it down. When it comes to softs, muted reactions across the board, although we're seeing a pullback here in lumber, down yet another 3.5% today. Although the rally in OJ, do yourself a favor and pull up a chart of OJ, look at what's happening here. Blasting higher. And today, OJ added about 3.5% worth of gains. Sugar futures. Similar story here. Look at the chart. And today, it added about 1 and 3 quarters of a percent worth of gains. When it comes to metals, muted reactions across the board. Although we have a pullback in copper, again, the dollar, in all likelihood, will pop higher again. My hunch is we're going to see the pullback in metals continuing. In gold, in silver, in platinum, in copper. So I'd rather be in oil right now because it's proven itself to be resilient to the rise in the dollar. This is what I call um, relative at performance and you got to follow these kind of leads when it comes to meats muted reactions across the board but lean hogs moving higher today scoring gains worth about one percent when it comes to grains futures we have muted reactions across the board but the outliers the ad performers wheat and rough rice up about two percent apiece and my hunch is if you look at the chart of wheat it is bottoming here we're due for a pop in wheat futures so when you say that inflation is dead and it's over you got another thing coming for you Onto the big casino, the options market, what do we see here? The volume holding up pretty good, although down slightly. We continue to see more buying of calls than puts, but cooling down a little bit. Signs of exhaustion, perhaps? And the moment we see buying of puts outweighing buying of calls, we got a confirmation of the reversal. But until then, the hottest table by far is Tesla, the souffle, with around 1.3 million contracts traded today. Look at this, about 59% of those were calls. We're going to cover Tesla in details in the charts analysis, because major, major volume showed up in the 200 calls today. And that was the reason behind the pop. But at number two, Google, aka Alphabet, a company that we love and adore, and we will never short. Anyways, it traded about 900,000 contracts today. About 62% of those were calls. So despite the fact that they absolutely blew up, was an embarrassment. Their AI, chat GPT competitor, investors, quote unquote investors, they're still buying the dip. Number three, Amazon, with around 820,000 contracts traded today, and oh, about 55.5% of those were calls. On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, and we begin with the ticker UBER, Uber. Now we have um, euphoria and a huge frenzy that, oh my God, the quarter was a blockbuster for Uber, yada, yada, yada. Now we have a generation of consumers who think that their jobs are in the bag once they link their uh credit cards to their Uber accounts, few swipes, you get the ride, and then uh, who cares? The rides are costing you 40, 50, 60 bucks for like a few blocks. But who cares? You'll, you'll pay it later next month uh, until you lose your job, of course. And if you know anything, you know we're going to see more and more layoffs. So I would dub this quarter for Uber as the last good quarter before we see the downfall. In the meantime, somebody's betting that the gains will continue. And they bought the 40 bucks calls for the expiration date, March 24th, with expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 8% by the expiration date, they paid around one buck a piece, Tanner. This trade, all in all, spending around half a million dollars. And then what about the trade for the ticker TLT? This is the 10-year, or not the 10-year, but the long-term bonds, bond prices we're talking about. So bond prices go down when yields go higher. There was an inverse relationship in case you did not know. Now, why would uh, yields go higher and bond prices go down? Maybe because inflation is making a comeback and the Fed will have to raise rates higher. This is exactly the bet that we see here because somebody's betting against the TLT, meaning betting that bond prices will go down and yields will go higher. And they bought the 100 puts for the expiration date, April 21, with expectations that the name could move down and lose more than 5% of its value by then. They paid around one buck a piece, Stanner. This trade all in all, spending around half a million dollars. And then what about the ticker MSFT, Microsoft AI Optimism? They have another banana they can hang their hats on. Absolute lunacy. So of course, somebody's buying calls here, betting that Microsoft is going to explode higher. 
and they bought the 295 calls for the expiration date, March 24th, with expectations that we will see gains north of 10.5% for the name by the expiration date. They paid around two bucks and 20 cents a piece, Tanner. This trade, all in all, spending around one million dollars. Now, folks who follow me on uh, Discord, you know why today was pretty much the reversal in Microsoft. Anyways, the last trade that we have today is UAL for United Airlines. Now, we still have this stupid optimism that all oh, airlines are so hot, cruises are so hot, the consumers flush with cash, and they can't wait to splurge in the economy. Yeah, all of that splurging ends when you max the credit card and you lose your job. In the meantime, somebody sees UAL pulling back, and they bought the 48 puts for the expiration date, February 24th, with expectations that the name will go down and lose more than 5.5% of its value by then. They paid around 60 cents a piece, Tanner. This trade all in all spending around $200,000. On to the heat map, what do we see here? A softening in the risk on segments of the stock market. We're we're talking about chips, they were down. We're talking about big tech, they were down big, led by Google, and the reason is they blew it up. They blew up their uh, AI bullshit. It was an absolute embarrassment. And even Microsoft was down, be it slightly, despite the Chad GPT mania. We also see the cyclical slash reopening names such as airlines, cruises, casinos, hotels, all down for the day. So no risk on. Is risk off catching a bid instead? Are we seeing a rotation? The answer is not quite. We have one segment of the risk off slash defensive names rallying hard today, and that is healthcare care, be it pharmaceuticals or the healthcare plans, but pay attention here. There could be some distortion here because CVS reported earnings and that lifted United Health and Humana and the rest of them. Now, we also saw some oil services moving higher, such as BP, SLB, but the rest of them were down, led by Chevron, CVX. And the reason is, and this is absolute stupidity, we have investors being afraid that, oh, Joe Biden is going to crack against Chevron because they stuck it to Biden with the buybacks. Biden is not going to do anything here. He's all bark, no bite. That's number one. Number two, it's not going to change the facts. Chevron pays an excellent dividend, and now it's offering $90 billion worth of buybacks. I disagree with buybacks, but I'll take them if I happen to be a shareholder of Chevron, and I am. So I see this as an opportunity to buy. Keep pushing it down, let the scared money get out of the name, and then we'll buy it and add to the position. But perhaps the outlier in today's... Um at performers, if we can call them that, Tesla the souffle. Tesla was up by about two and a quarter percent. Why was it up? It was mechanical in nature. I'm going to explain to you why in the charts analysis, but before we do that, what about the heat map for the ETFs? Now, no major movement for the dollar, no major movement for yields, at least today. So we don't have any feedback to base the action on. Yet pretty much all of them were down. Energy down, energy ETFs, that is, down, with the exception of the OIH, because that is um, oil services, which includes SLB, which was an app performance today. But besides that, biotech down, chips down, tech down, retail down, metals down, utilities down, everything is down. Growth down, value down, Chinese equities down. And the only art performers, if you can call them that, the defensives, XLV healthcare, XLP consumer defensives, but be it, they're all in the red. And the only ETFs closing in the green, besides the inverse ETFs, we have the EWZ Brazil. This is the commodities giant. And we have a pop in commodities, specifically in oil. So EWZ is moving higher. And then we have INDA, India. It has been a disaster with the Adani affair. But now we have a rebound. Is it going to last? Is it not going to last? I think the Adani crisis was the moment the bubble in the Indian stock market was popped. And there is no coming back from that. It's over. You're going to see rebounds. But from this point on, the Indian market is going down. And by the way, that's a good thing. Because who wanted to buy India at insane valuations? At bubble territory? We want to bargain. As international investors, we want to bargain in the Indian market. Or we're getting the bargain. So that's a good thing. Anyhow, let's move on to charts. And uh, I said this in this court today. I said volume remains anemic in the market. It appears that we have already reached buying climax. And I talked about that, that we're going to see buying climax last week. And indeed, we do have buying climax. And we're not finding a lot of buying volume. On the other hand, shorts remain traumatized. And holders, meaning those who bought the rally year to date, be it shorts covering or legitimate buyers or buyers of call options who exercise those options, doesn't matter what they are. They have no incentive to sell. So we're seeing weakness in the market, but not decisive yet. We're waiting for a spark to change the sentiment and encourage selling slash profit taking slash shorting. Now, is this going to happen uh, from Fed speed? I doubt it. 
Is it going to happen from the CPI? That could be it. Because think about the psychology right now. If you entered the year short and you decided to cover because of taxation reasons, you did pretty good. You covered and you saw a massive rally. And now you're thinking, you're observing, you're looking at charts, you're looking at calculations, but you haven't made up your mind yet. You haven't seen the smoking gun to make a bet one way or the other. Now, on the other hand, if you entered the year short and you did not cover, it is what it is. You got caught in the short squeeze. Either you booked profits less than expectations or you're confident that these stocks will go down again and you don't see a reason to cover right now. So you're still holding, you're neutral, you're just watching and seeing. Now what happens if you've been long the stock market and you entered the year holding the bank? You're excited about the rally but you're still down and the debate now becomes do you get out at this point at a better point than last year? You're still down but you're not down as much as last year. So it is a better exit point. But in that debate, the other side goes, what if this is a bull market? What if the bear market is over? What if we see a pullback and then the market rallies higher again? And if you sell, you're going to feel like a fool because the market is recovering. You should be adding to your position right now. So we have this type of trader, this type of investor, having no incentive at all to make any decisions right now. And then we have those who did buy the rally year to date. They're up big, in certain cases up 50, 60, 70 percent. What is the incentive right now to sell? Because they have greed. They feel greed. I scored big. I want to score more. And I'm not seeing any sign of a reversal. I'm not seeing anything that tells me, okay, you got to get out now. If anything, I'm feeling this is a new bull market. So when it comes to the participants of the stock market, the psychology, we're now stuck. Nobody wants to make decisions at all. Everybody's looking at the other player. You making a move, bro? You're not making a move. How about you? How about you? I'm not making a move. How about you? Nobody's making a move right now. So we need something from the outside to motivate us to make a move one way or the other, either to add to the bets and rally even higher or stampede to the exit door to book profits and to short. And that could produce a massive pullback. Now, what would this spark be? The only thing that I can see right now is the CPI. So keep that in mind. And with this background out of the way, let's look at the charts, the SPY, 30 minutes. What do we see here? Nothing happened today. Within range, support, 410. Resistance, 416. Nothing happened. No break one way or the other. It was a down day, sure. But do we have a break? Absolutely not. Now, the bears would argue that this is a bear flag consolidation pattern. Well, you're not going to know until it plays out. But this is what the bears are bidding on. That look, the chart is stalling here. It is making lower lows. You don't have to be a genius to figure out that this is going to go down. The bulls would say, yeah, we've heard this story over and over and over again. And you guys keep eating pies in the face over and over and over again. All what we're doing right now is retesting support, gathering some new players, and then higher we go. So the 30 minutes doesn't say anything at all. What about the daily for the continuous contract? What does it say here? Look at the RSI. Still in positive momentum, positive divergence. But it is curling down. It is weakening. One more down candle. And the momentum in the RSI is going to reverse from positive to negative. And the same goes for the MACD. Now, the RSI is the leading indicator. The MACD is the lagging indicator, which we use for confirmation. So your confirmation would be the chart losing 4,100, better yet losing 4,037. And then you get a confirmation from the MACD crossing and producing a red impression on the histogram. That would be your confirmation that the run is over. But for now, and I keep cautioning you guys, the risk remains to the upside that we could see in a ABC pattern. It's hard to kill such a bullish euphoric sentiment because there are folks waiting on the sidelines. They see a dip, the recency bias kicks in. Look, we, we've seen dips in Tesla and Amazon, not Amazon. <laughs> Amazon is getting massacred, but Apple, Microsoft, and they bounced higher. So maybe this is a dip to buy. It's hard to kill this sentiment. You got to see a hard reversal. You got to see fear, panic, and changes of assumptions. And that's not going to happen without a fundamental piece, a macro piece of data that says, watch out, inflation is moving higher. Fed is not going to cut rates anytime soon. They're actually going to raise rates higher. That would be the reversal. And the odds now looking at the charts, momentum indicators, saying this is the most likely outcome. But there is a risk, too, that if the CPI is cooked for whatever reason and it comes out tame, we could see an explosion to the upside because all of those waiting on the sidelines will have their confirmation that it is the time to hop in. And they missed out. You're going to see an explosion of FOMO. So I think the CPI is pivotal here. But for now, in the immediate run, in like tomorrow's session, the risk remains to the upside. In next week's activities, the risk is to the downside. Why do we say that? Because the momentum indicators are bloated right now. We'll look at the Qs, the Nasdaq. 
stack, 30 minutes, similar story here. Nothing happened. Support, 300. You can say that support is actually 304, but that is soft support. The hard support is 372, and the resistance is 308.55. Nothing happened today. Of course, the bears would say this is a bear flag consolidation pattern, but you're not going to know until you have a break. So what about the daily chart for the continuous contract? Does it offer anything different here? Yes, it does. For one thing, we have a negative divergence in the RSI. The MACD is just a matter of time before we see a crossing and red impressions being uh, printed on the histogram. For now, the chart is making lower highs, but we don't have a break yet, and the risk in the immediate term remains to the upside. This could be an ABC pattern. This could be a Harami candlestick pattern, and higher we go. So you got to keep that in mind. You got to see a lower low in the pattern, and then we're talking. And if we zoom in, I talked about the 30 minutes or the hourly chart of the continuous contract. You have a clear trend line. Watch last night's video. You got to watch for the revisit and the retest of that trend line. And if it fails, then we got a confirmation. And what about the IWM? Russell 2000, small caps, 30 minutes, nothing happened today. Within range, support 191.5, resistance 196.5. No break one way or the other. Now, now, what about the Dixie? The most important indicator we have right now, it ran a retest at 103. So far, so good. The momentum is accelerating to the upside with plenty of room to go. In the RSI, MACD, we can go to 105, 106, even north of that if we have an explosion in the Dixie and massive short covering. Now, that's only going to happen if we get data suggesting that this is this recent assumption, the most recent one, that the Fed is behind the game, made a mistake with the 25, they should do 50. If that assumption is proven correct, then we're going to see an explosion in the Dixie. What will be the catalyst for that? The answer is the CPI. And if we have an explosion in the Dixie, equities will go down big time. Keep that in mind. You know what else would go down big? How about gold? Gold right now is forming a bear flag pattern. I think it needs to go down to 1842. It needs to go and visit a solid support. And then we take it from there. What about oil? Brent oil? I'd rather be in oil. I've been telling you this all along, folks. I'd rather be in oil than gold. Because I missed the ratty in gold. What is the point of chasing it right now? Oil continues to move higher in the case of Brent. It is now facing an important number 85 if it closes above 85 so far so good if it pulls back from 85 also so far so good so long as it goes down to the trend line rebounds and cracks above 85 again but make no mistake 85 is a pivotal point here when we look at the 10-year yield the daily chart what do we see here we have a bull flag consolidation pattern today we had an auction so i'm not surprised to see yields down but the message here is clear the dollar and yields are saying we gotta shoot up higher but as let's let's be honest folks if you happen to be bear in this market, you don't want to see the dollar and the 10-year blasting higher ahead of the CPI print. Because if that happens, the risk becomes to the downside. But yes, the CPI might come out hot, but maybe not as hot as we anticipated. And then we see the dollar flushing down along with the 10-year. We see equities rallying again. Now, what would happen if yields and the dollar rally onto the CPI print? It means we're going to see a big pullback in the equities market. So if you happen to be bear, you don't want to see a big pullback right now. You actually want to see little pullbacks consolidation because that keeps the risk to the downside when the cpi comes out i hope that's clear that's all psychology here but if the bull flag plays out in the 10 year we have 3.8 that will be target number one and then we have four percent which i believe will get there that will be target number two if that is the case tlt will go down tlt popped higher today because we had an auction but my assumption is it will go down further and we will see yields firming up vix four hours if you still believe in the vix it popped higher today not above 20 which if you believe the cpi will come out hot and equities will go down big reversal and this is the chance to accumulate put options and more by the way if you bought the rally and you don't want to sell because maybe this is a bull market maybe you're gonna regret your decision if you sell now and you panic the question becomes why not hedge why not hedge lock your gains by buying put options on the positions that you have puts are cheap right now the vix is below 20 this is the opportunity to hedge right now and for shorts to bet against the market right now because the premiums are low but if the VIX pops above 20, it goes to 22, 25, 30, then premiums will become expensive and then Johnny come lately's will come, hey Maverick, do I buy puts now? Um, where were you when the VIX was below 20? That was the opportunity. Now again, the VIX is uh, not reliable anymore, but if we're going to read into it, if we use a two hours chart this time around and we use a line chart instead, isn't this a cup and handle formation? Another way we can look at it, isn't this a reverse head and shoulder formation? If that is the case, the VIX goes higher, SPY goes down. And the king of the SPY in the queues is the big kahuna apple. 30 minutes chart, today we have what it appears to be a double top formation and apple went down. 
consolidating in a bear flag pattern. Is it decisive? Absolutely not. For now, we're just consolidating within range. The signal to short Apple will come if we see 150 broken as support. Now, I'm already have a short position in Apple, but if it goes below 150, I'll add to the position. So 150 is an important support here. And I think it's just a matter of time before we lose 150 as support sooner or later. This is the no entry zone and the company did not provide any piece of evidence that grants it entry to this zone. It's going to get towed sooner or later. We'll look at Tesla, the souffle, and we'll look at a 15 minutes chart. Yesterday, we talked about consolidation patterns at around 194.55. And I said for the chart to pop higher out of the consolidation range, it needs huge volume, not the regular volume of, oh, just a few folks buying the stock or buying the 200 calls. You got to see massive explosion. And today we got the massive explosion. Look at this. For the 200 calls contract, over 180,000 were traded today. You know what that translates to in tangible shares of Tesla? That means, technically speaking, over 180 million shares of Tesla were traded in the 200 contracts alone. That is more than the entire outstanding shares of Tesla. Absolute insanity, especially when you look at the 205. Over 145,000 contracts traded for that one. 210. Over 130,000 contracts. This is absolute insanity. And it's also a sign that the insanity is coming to an end. Because look at what's happening. Even with the stock popping, these premiums are so expensive, they're not making a lot of money here. They're making 14%, 2%. That's nothing in options lingo. So at some point, they're going to realize that this is not worth it anymore. And the stock is not popping higher, despite massive volume. We're not seeing 5 6% pops. All what we did is a pathetic 2 and a quarter percent worth of a pop. It is coming to an end. And on top of that, you have negative divergence on the RSI of the 15 minutes chart. And when we look at the 4 hours, for example, we have an important resistance line here at 200 100.82. Folks, I'm not giving you advice at all, but for me, I've seen enough and I did pull the trigger today and I bought Tesla put options. When it comes to BTC, Bitcoin, what do we see here in the daily chart? Nothing happening, consolidating at the important resistance slash support, 23,189. We need a break one way or the other. For now, Bitcoin, believe it or not, is actually showing relative strength. Why do we say that? Because the RSI is moving down in negative divergence, fixing the overbought conditions, quote unquote, yet the chart is not pulling back. It is consolidating. That is a sign that the chart is strong. The problem is it's going to run out of time. And if the buyers don't show up, the sellers are going to de-risk before the CPI. And we might see once again the head and shoulder formation. But it doesn't mean that this is written in stone. For now, Bitcoin still has the possibility that it could pop higher. It just needs a little bit of buying coming in. Now, here are some bonus charts for you. We talked about these on Discord. Meta, an hourly chart. I've been eyeing the support of 183.85. Today, we have have consolidation bear flag consolidation pattern and it broke the support line a tiny bit now you can play with the support line and say it's actually 183.55 if you're really conservative you'd go to 183 it doesn't matter the pattern is bearish right now and it appears that the chart ran out of buyers it has been consolidating within range for days now what does that mean sooner or later to de-risk before the cpi we will see folks sitting on massive gains here to date booking profits and pushing the chart down and we see the bear flag playing out in other words, the opportunity is in buying puts in Meta. And here's another one, NVIDIA, an hourly chart, massive rally year to date. We have a trend line here if you look at the hourly chart. We have two events coming here worthy of de-risking if you've been buying NVIDIA. Number one, earnings. Number two, the CPI. So the likelihood is, at a minimum, we will see a pullback and a revisit to the trend line. And that would be a decline of about 4% or so. Now, the premiums for puts are going to be elevated. But remember, the VIX is under 20 right now. I did buy some uh, contracts for NVIDIA with Marsh experience. And they were actually cheap. I was stunned by it. So my plan is, NVIDIA pulls back ahead of earnings, ahead of the CPI. The premiums will continue to appreciate in value. What I'm going to do is use that opportunity to turn my trade into a spread by opening either a debit spread. For example, I bought the 200 call, 200 puts, excuse me. I can sell the 190 puts. And at that point, the 190 might actually be worth more than the 200 puts that I bought earlier. And therefore, my entry cost gets reduced to zero. Or I will have the option to sell the 190 with the expiration date of February, for example, and I can reduce my entry cost and maximize my profit potential. Haven't made up my mind yet, but folks, when you have the market stalling right now, when you have the VIX below 20, you have the CPI coming, you have earnings coming, you gotta take the advantage here. They're handing you the trade on a silver platter. Are you gonna take it or not? Because on top of that, you got the dollar moving higher, and that's bad for chips. When we look at the daily chart for 
Nvidia, we don't have a confirmation yet, but it appears that we do have a topping candle. Now we've been fooled before, so we need a confirmation and then some. But again, from an options lingo perspective, just because we have two events coming, the CPI and earnings, premiums for puts will appreciate automatically, even if Nvidia moves a little higher from here. So keep that in mind. Now let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Not a lot. We have initial jobless claims and continuing jobless claims. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Take care. My theory on feds is they're like mushrooms. Feed them shit and keep them in the dark. The girls have a good day. <laughs>